So my topic is the chain of responsibility laws and how they provide a new tool to pay for remediation of contaminated sites. In outline, what I'm going to cover, I just want to give you a bit of a factual context for these laws because they're a really, I think, an exciting development in Queensland. If we think of environmental law and the major laws that protect the environment as like a toolbox that regulators can use, then this is a really useful tool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Link Energy which has been this plethora of uh, litigation in the last few years in Queensland. And then I just want to touch on the policy context and then the context within the Queensland environmental legal system and then the chain of responsibility laws themselves within our Environmental Protection Act. Just briefly mention the case law. It's, it's, the laws have been in operation for two years. There's been a whole heap of litigation around Link Energy. Not a lot of litigation particularly on the chain of responsibility laws, but the, it's the issues around them and how they're actually embedded. And this is a, a useful time to talk about this topic because we've just had the two-year review published. And it's a useful review. It's short, and I highly recommend it if you're interested in this topic. There's two, thing, there's two publications that are really useful. The guidelines on the chain of responsibility laws that the, the department's put out, as well as the review that's just out, which I think is only eight pages long, and really interesting how it's been implemented. So, and then, yeah, discussion questions. So, just in terms of the factual context, there's a huge number of abandoned mines in Australia, about 50,000 of them, and in uh, Queensland alone, there's about 15,000. So that was based on a 2007 estimate, uh, about $1 billion to rehabilitate. And frankly, most of them will never be re rehabilitated, like the Mount Morgan mine, which I was going to talk about, but it's not particularly useful for Cora, but that's a big mine up near Rockhampton that has, yeah, basically it's just leaching stuff into the Dee River and it probably will never be rehabilitated. So a lot of them just sit there forever, damaging not just the land, but then also surrounding uses. So with the Mount Morgan mine, the Dee River, it looks terrible like, yeah. So I don't want to talk about Mount Morgan though and abandoned mines as such, because when we think about contaminated sites, it's not just mines as such. You can have a whole range of other things. These laws were particularly created in 2016 with concerns around um, Queensland Nickel, so Clive Palmer's big nickel refinery up at, just north of Townsville, which has got massive tailings dams, and when that company had severe financial problems, so let's leave Queensland Nickel to one side. It actually hasn't been used for, for under the Cora laws, but it was one of the reasons for creating it. If you've got this complex corporate structure and your normal links to prosecuting someone don't work, then Cora was created to basically go after where the money went to. That's basically the idea. So Link Energy uh, is, a, is one uh, of the cases where it has been used and there's been this massive amount of investigation. It's been a, Queensland's biggest environmental investigation and case. And just mid last year, the company was fined 4.5 million. So record fine. And essentially it involved a just a bit of background on Link. So it was created in 1996 or incorporated in 1996. At its height, it was valued, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. In 2010, it sold um, its Carmichael mine site to Adani for 500 million. Uh, and then, you know, so it had a lot, hundreds of millions of dollars it was going out, it was going to, uh, in the US and the like. And then it all went pear-shaped for them and they ended up going into liquidation in 2016 with claims against them of 325 million so a lot of money involved just to look at the chinchilla site so chinchilla is what four or five hours drive west of brisbane so we're here on the coast if you drove west for a long way went through Toowoomba and um, got out to chinchilla then it's a lovely farming area and south of chinchilla about 20 kilometers uh, Link Energy had its basically an experimental underground gasification goal, coal gasification plant and if I just focus in on that, that's it in 2011 and it operated from about 2007 to about 2013. This is it at its height, there's when it's actually in operation but basically this is just a diagram that Link had, you basically pump stuff in, set the coal on fire and then draw out the gas and turn it into a liquid. So it was basically coal to liquids, but you don't dig down to the coal. And it's basically 
coal that's pretty well deeper than around 100 meters is its sort of optimum level and that's getting that's at a level that's quite ex really expensive to dig down because you've got to remove all the overburden so how do you get to it cheaply and you either go underground you know getting down in an open cut pit is expensive to remove all the overburden so that's in a nutshell and basically these guys had an experimental design and basically it's summarized in like the sentencing remarks last year from uh, judge shanahan basically yeah fracking pump down gases generate basically try and generate gas from the coal that you then turn into liquids and you're setting the coal on fire it it all went pear-shaped and yeah now the site is pretty well vacant but it also had a massive contaminant plume and this is a map that was put out by the department of environment in 2015 basically a excavation caution zone because there were gas and basically there was prob it, the gas was so um, problematic in this area that there were concerns about it actually exploding so farmers had no dig areas and this was an excavation caution zone that just got removed um, the beginning of last year the, the site the, the gas levels are dropping back down but you know that that area is 20 kilometers across and yeah and huge amount of really good quality agricultural land so you can understand the people in that area are hopping mad about it I just want to touch on one more thing before I turn to Cora there was a financial assurance so the typical tool that government uses to ensure that remediation occurs is uh, they estimate what the cleanup cost will be and then require the um, miner to put that into a, a bond uh, and that can be drawn upon the bond for this got up to 3.3 million and then they basically the government tried to include increase it to 25 million uh, and that's been basically put on hold so the, the bond is only 3.3 million um, and the estimated cost I saw a figure of something like 38 million the bond that was held was far less than the actual cleanup costs so just want to touch turn briefly to the policy context so I, I find it really valuable just to mention that because you know we all, lawyers often talk about you know regulation but don't talk about policy basics and you know um, Stephen Dover's work is fantastic in this in this space we all know about the policy cycle the idea you identify a problem you go through steps of policy analysis consultation coordination implement something and then review it evaluate and Cora is a really good example of that sort of cyclical process because we've now just had the review and yeah it seems to be an important tool that's not being overused would be the simple summary I'd give of the evaluation so I really like Neil Gunningham and Peter Grabowski's work. I still think that that's a seminal work in environmental regulation, smart regulation. They talk about the critical importance of designing policy instrument combinations. And CORA should be seen in that context. It's a combining with a whole range of other things in the legislation. And yeah, you look for complementary instrument mixes. So you try and be less as little intervention as you can but then you ascend as you need to so try to be try to have as little regulation as you can but have enough to do what you want so this classic adage of regulators speak softly and carry a big stick is the classic for environmental regulation but yeah and you can also think about it I like to think about it in this way I years ago I was in the Army Reserve and talked about defense in depth which is the idea of having lines of defense that support each other and you can fall back to and Cora you could think of as like the keep like right in the middle of the castle this is the the last line of defense if everything else has failed use Cora go after the cleanup because you basically you're going to try and use your um, conditions and financial assurance first and that should be like the moat around your castle that you know you stop basically the barbarians getting in uh, and you know there's so much work in this space that you know about um, Malcolm Sparrow's um, regulatory craft book talks about picking important problems and fixing them I like the idea though that we never really fix environmental problems it's always a question of you, c you don't just create something and then it's fixed forever you have a you have a instruments that you put together and then you, you have the hard work of actually implementing them so Barnett Barlett's work um, talks about think of environmental regulation not like engineering but more like gardening so I think of and I tell my students you know think of yourself and your career as a gardener you're not going to fix these problems you're just going to help manage them for some time 
And so within our environmental legal system, uh, if I just drill down into it, I use a four-layered approach to explain environmental law in a little book called Synopsis of the Queensland Environmental Legal System. So we've got international law at the top, we know that. We've got national laws beneath that. And then if we come down into our Queensland laws, we've got a whole range of pieces of legislation that regulate impacts on the environment and beneath that, the common law. So the CORA amendments are in the Environmental Protection Act. So a central part of the state environmental regulatory system, particularly important for mining, um, but not the only piece by any means. And so within the Act, so we, if we're basically drilling in, there's multiple tools within it. One of the important tools has been environmental protection orders that can be basically given to order someone to stop doing an offence. So it's a, the department, the regulator can order, you know, if you're committing an offence, they can order you to stop. So, uh, and then if you don't, you can then go to court. Within that context, the CORA laws are linked to the environmental protection orders and effectively they, what they're aimed at is particularly where, I did this little chart, how to simply summarise what CORA does that other things don't. So in our lines of defence in the Environmental Protection Act, the first thing we use is conditions. We say you must rehabilitate your site, don't leave it degraded. The second thing is we have a financial assurance that if they do leave it degraded, the government can basically draw on this money to do the remediation itself. But if that fails, if you don't have enough money in the kitty, then what do you do? Well, you can prosecute them, but if the, if the company itself doesn't have sufficient funds and the money's gone, like directors have given it to their spouse or, you know, it's disappeared to the uncle who's in you know, the cousin who's somewhere in Europe that we don't know where he is, but we can have dinner with him whenever we want, but we just can't bring him before the courts. If, if it's like disappeared to that, that cousin, what can we do? We can go after them with CORA. CORA is designed for basically, if the primary offenders don't have enough money, follow the money and go after it. So it's deliberately flexible, and it's built around the 363C of the Act, and particularly the definition of related person, which is deliberately very broad. I won't go to that because I'm out of time, but basically it allows, the mechanism allows the department to give an order to someone who isn't just a director or isn't, so it could be a shareholder, it could be a parent company, um, someone who's not directly responsible but where the money from the benefits from the activity have gone to. And the, you might be concerned that well, that could, you know, banks and other investors could be concerned that, you know, they'll be hit with the cleanup cost and how do they insure against that? And the government's been really clear that genuine investors that they won't go after. If you actually look at the legislation, it's broad enough to do it. But the reason why it's got to be broad is because <laughs> bad and unreasonable people are very clever and they can come up with trust structures, you know, complex corporate structures all sorts of bullshit to put the regulators off the trail. My f the first, um, uh, I've got to wrap up, but a little adage, the f when Cora came in, a solicitor called me and basically wanted an advice on how he could tell his clients how they could get around it. And w which, <laughs> like my simple answer is basically don't breach the law and have in place good management plans and have enough money to fix it. And if you're a genuine operator and not shady, they're not going to come after you. But if you are shady, then A, I don't want you as a client. And um, yeah. So look, um, if you're interested in Cora, just to wrap up, the guidelines uh, that are put out, 44 pages, packed with information that's meant to calm investors and those sorts of things, really valuable to read. There's a whole heap of litigation around Link Energy. Peter Bond um, has been, is one, was the CEO. He's had Cora uh, orders against him, uh, and there's ongoing litigation against him. Uh, a good friend of mine is, I think had his second investment or probably 10th investment property based on um, representing Peter. Um, so a lot of litigation. Great if you're the solicitor for him or the barrister. A two-year review is just out. If you're interested in this topic, highly recommend it. It's only eight pages long. You can just do a search for it. Really valuable. It basically says there's only been sort of four Cora orders issued, one of them against Peter Bond. It hasn't been overused, but it, that doesn't mean that it's 
not useful. So just to wrap up, factual context, you know, contaminated abandoned sites are a real problem. We need to, to fix them. But if you want to think of Cora in one way, think of it like a castle. And this is defense in depth. And this is the Cora is the keep in the middle that you fall back to if all else fails. And you don't want to use it, but it's there. And so a useful tool I'd suggest for other jurisdictions as well. Thanks.